All right, God is so good. I just want to make sure I mention this as well. Um, everyone who is faithful, you guys online, you guys here that have continued to give to the church and continue to participate in the ministry, I cannot thank you enough. I cannot thank you enough. God is so good. He is providing for us. He's taking care of our needs. And the reason that is, is because you are faithful. You've responded. And I'm telling you right now, God has blessed the ministry and the work here. And so I know that I say this each week, but just thank you, thank you, thank you so, oh, so very much. So very much. God is so good. Amen? Amen. All right. Kids, let's go ahead and head downstairs. Kids, church, kids. All right. Um... Man, it's warm in here. Yeah. Is it warm in here to anybody? Yes. Okay. All right, I mean, I know I kind of heat up the place anyway, but... Um, I know I, I do. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it is that shiny head. It's kind of reflective. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is. It is, Kelly. Um, anyhow, so we are concluding... Our um, get your hopes up message this morning or message series this morning, um, and I want to talk to you guys for just a minute. I'm going to talk to you guys about an event that happened after the resurrection, but I want to read something to you so that we can get it in our minds what we're celebrating today and what it means. So um, it was Good Friday. And we call it Good Friday, but it's hard sometimes to call it that because it was such a dark day. But just prior to the events for Good Friday or of Good Friday, they arrested Jesus and convinced the authorities to crucify him as a criminal. A man of innocence embraced the guilt of this world and walked toward Golgotha. Jesus, a king unlike any other, wore a different crown, a robe as the Roman guards escorted him to a different throne marked by a sign declaring him as king. The king would choose to use his power to forgive captors and save his tormentors. Jesus, the king of kings, chose to use his sovereignty to die for the transgressions of all humanity. Good Friday is the day we remember the king of the universe who, brought lo who was brought low to us. The death of death came through his words. It is finished. And as we thought about yesterday, it was black or holy Saturday. And Saturday's darkness is the day that Jesus lay in the grave finishing the work he was destined to. The king finished earthly ministry. The war waged against sin had been won. On the cross, all that condemned us, Jesus bore, and it was done. There's nothing more to do. No score to settle. No work is left as Jesus lay in the tomb. There is nothing to be added because it is finished, as he said. And then it's Resurrection Sunday, as promised throughout history. Sunday came. A day of resurrection had arrived. Easter day, Jesus proved himself as king, the one who holds all things together. King Jesus fought the grave, and on this day, death itself was defeated. The king or the truth of God's Son dying for our sins and rising from the dead, the good news of Christ spread. This is why today is Easter, a day of celebrating resurrection. Today we celebrate a resurrection so powerful that others exited their graves alive again. you got to read the story. It's there. Today we know with certainty that we've been rescued by the eternally reigning king of heaven and earth. Today, resurrection, Sunday, we remember the king of kings and all that he endured. Jesus went to war with death, was executed on a cross, lay dead in a borrowed tomb, and raised victorious over it all. He is our God in flesh, our king of kings, our savior who reigns eternally. And I often say this, 
today we celebrate because we are an Easter people in resurrection or hallelujah is our song. This is what we celebrate today. This is what we celebrate today. This is our moment. Yes, I know that there are fun things that we do. Spring is upon us. There are Easter egg hunts and all of that stuff. And I don't have any problems or beef with that. But I want to make sure that we remember what today means. I want to make sure that we do our best to experience, to live in, to understand what Jesus did for each one of us. And so this morning, I want to talk to you guys about not being afraid. We can get our hopes up because we don't have to be afraid. Now, it's the day of resurrection. Now, some of us are like, wait a minute, it was Friday and then it was Sunday. How was that three days in the tomb? Just so you guys know, backing up a little bit, culturally speaking, their time and their days and all that stuff were different than ours. Okay? They operated on a different time. Um, I wish that our nights were longer, just saying. Anyway, <laughs> so they, offer, they operated differently. Okay? But Jesus has appeared to the women, all right? He's appeared to Mary. There's these, you know, they were going to the tomb with spices. There's some more story involved there, but the tomb was open and Jesus was gone, all right? They've already met him. They've already been in his presence. What are the disciples doing? The ones that were left, the 11, what are they doing? If you look at the story, they're hiding behind locked doors. They're hiding. They're like, ooh, all right? I still don't understand men. Come on. Mm. You know, like your height. <laughs> Anybody who looks at the Bible and thinks for just a second that it is domineering and it's disrespectful and women aren't given privilege or freedom, it is the cultural context of that day. But keep in mind that Jesus was about making sure that women were involved and making sure that they participated. Amen. He visited they saw him first. They saw him first. And then they went and told the disciples, they're like, eh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, Thomas himself, who gets a bad rap, said, I won't believe until I touch his nails and his scars and put my hands in his wounds. And, you know, okay, let's go, Thomas. Anyway, so John 20, verse 19, all right, this is what it says. Um, in verse 19, it says, Sunday evening, it's Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. And he said, peace, peace be with you, he said. And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and, in his, and his side. They were filled with joy and they saw the Lord. And, he said, and, and again he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. That wasn't giving them power over people's forgiveness. That was to indicate the, the cause, the message, the way, as they called it in that time, that they were about to go and spread the gospel. And if you look, we won't go into this, but if you look later on, Thomas seems to be late to the party, all right? Thomas, also called Didymus, all right, T. Diddy. Anyway, he, he, he arrived at the scene late, and Thomas is like, I'm not going to believe until I touch his wounds. And he indeed does. There's a terrifying situation. This is, this is scary. There are things going on, all right, just... Observations really quick. They're behind locked doors. They're scared. They're behind locked doors. They're scared. And Jesus is suddenly among them. He didn't like, let me in, guys. I'm right here. Like, no, no, no. That's someone impersonating Jesus. Don't open the door. The Romans are coming. Like, they were scared. They were scared. They're, they're cowering. They're hiding. The doors are locked. And then all of a sudden, poof, Jesus is there. He's like, hey, guys. They freaked out. Other portions of this story, the Gospels, um, the authors of the Gospels approach it a little bit differently in each story. They're like, it's a ghost. And like, all of us would be there, right? We'd be terrified. We'd be frightened. See, the first thing that we need to know this morning is there is no place that Jesus can't be. There's no place that Jesus can't be. There is fear that grips our life. It's real. 
We get terrified by our experiences. We get terrified that we're going to ruin our life. We get terrified that our children are going to ruin their lives. We get terrified that something is going to go awry. I'm telling you right now, if I don't have an issue with the technology involved in our morning services, before morning service, I'm fearful that something is wrong. Like we live in a day and age where if something's not wrong, we feel like something's wrong. Like we feel wrong that something's not wrong. Oh, come on, you've been there before. Like, okay, I'm just waiting for the next event. I'm waiting for the next shoe to drop. I'm waiting for the next moment to go bad. But we get afraid. We get afraid. We're afraid that everything's going to shipwreck. And what do we do? All right, let's think about it for a minute. We lock ourselves inside. We just, we're going to hide. We're not going to deal with it. We're not going to address it. We're just going to hide in ourselves. We're going to hide away from the situations, hide away from the struggles. And we lock ourselves up. We lock ourselves up. Like if I put some walls up, if I lock the doors, no one can get inside. And I would just sit there and hide from all the pain and all the difficulties and all the challenges in this life. I'll just hide. But there's no place that Jesus can't be. That's how Jesus loves us. That's, that's who Jesus is. That's how he works. Now, I know that, and this is point number two, just jump into it really fast, though the acceptance of peace is our choice. It is Christ who comes to us with it, not to us coming to him. All right, Jesus offers it. I'm here. <laughs> Jesus is like, I'm here. Here's my peace. Here's my promise. Here's my freedom. And we have to make that decision on our own to accept that. But you don't go to him to find peace. You don't go to him. He comes to you. That's the whole plan. That was the whole purpose, right? If you look at the scripture, it tells us that Jesus came at just the right time. At just the right time. Now, sometimes we don't like that because we know in our own minds that it's not the right time. And Jesus is saying, no, it is the right time. You don't understand, Lord. This situation is bad and things are not going well. I need you to come on time. And Jesus is like, your timeline is not the same as my timeline. All right? Don't compare him to the fact that your family always seems to make you run late. All right? I know. We think all this, that we're, we're being patient with God, but the truth is, is he's the one being patient with us. You know, like, you don't want to force something to happen super fast because then we're going to mess it all up. But anyway, there is no place that he can't be. He will step into our situations. He will step into our struggles. He will step into wherever we are. Now, I need to make this about point two. I need to say this. Though, um, Jesus isn't angry when he has to repeat himself. He's not angry when he has to repeat himself. If you look at the text, he doesn't go down and he's like, man, what's wrong with you guys? Seriously. Didn't I not talk about this? It, again, you got to read the story. If you go back and you see all the ministry, all the things that Jesus is doing, all the work with the disciples, he's like, hey, look, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die on the cross. The temple's going to be wrecked and I'm going to resurrect. I'm going to die and resurrect. He told them over and over again. That's what it says in the scripture. And he tells them over and over and over again. And they're like, oh no, he died. Oh no, he died. And Jesus shows up on a scene. And he's like, hey guys, look, I'm here. I told you, I was coming back. And he didn't say like, he... he I didn't come to them and say, you morons, what is wrong with you? Why are you hiding? Do you see the ladies coming and finding me, being the first to see me, and you guys are sitting back here behind locked doors? Oh, no, they're going to come get me. No, he didn't come at them like that. No. He came to them and said, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Some of us, we need that. Like, we don't need Jesus standing up there with a billy club knocking us over the head. Like, you... Didn't I tell you that you could have this? Didn't I tell you to do it this way? Didn't I tell you about the promises that I want to bring you? Didn't I tell you about the peace? All right? What good will it do if Jesus is like, I told you you could be at peace. Now be at peace. Whoa. <laughs> like, seriously, dude. Why don't you relax? No, no, no. Jesus arrives on the scene. 
Now, obviously, he has to say peace immediately because he is suddenly standing there. Any one of us in that situation would be like, that's a ghost. Either that or I have trauma, and that PTSD is causing me to see hallucinations. I'm like seeing things that aren't there. Some of us know what I'm talking about. I'm seeing things that aren't there, all right? And I'm not, I'm not playing with people who really struggle with that. Please understand that, okay? I understand. But, but he's right there, and he's like, they're like, if you look at the other Gospels, they're like, it's a ghost. It's a ghost. It's a ghost. And Jesus is like, no, I'm not a ghost. In fact, in one, he said, I'll show you. And he shows them the scars. And then one of the Gospels, he said, give me something to eat. And they're like, okay, I'm going to prove it to you. All right, why did he ask for something to eat? He's been laying in a grave for three days, you know? Like, they're leading him up to the cross. They didn't feed him. They didn't take care of him before he died on the cross. And then he's in the grave for a couple of days, three days. And he's like, oh, hey, um, a few days, oh, uh, why don't we eat something, all right? Why don't we eat something? And something beautiful happens. Something beautiful happens. And he comes to us with peace. He says it twice, as if they needed to hear it twice. Sometimes we need to have messages. We need to have things reiterated to us over and over and over again because we are a stubborn people, and we don't always get it the first time. It's not just a guy problem either, just saying, all right? Everyone struggles with this. Everyone. Why do you think when you read the Gospels, why do you think when you read the, 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 you know, the letters that the apostles wrote, why do you think when you read it in the text, it's like, man, didn't I read this just a few you know, chapters ago? Or didn't I read this just like a couple of verses ago? Because... The scripture reiterates details so that we can come to important conclusions about our life and about who we are and about what we need. And so Jesus in his love and his compassion, he's like, shalom. He's like, peace, peace I give to you. Peace, be at peace. Be comforted, be encouraged, be strengthened in this moment because I am giving you peace. I am giving you peace. And the next thing he does is, you know, the next thing he does is he breathes into them. Because of Christ, we are alive. Jesus breathes into them power. He gives them power. He, he gives, gives them power. His spirit enters them. Now, I know that's kind of weird. Like, I understand. We, we talked about some of the weird things that Jesus did, okay? We talked, we talked about saliva, okay? We have talked about some of those things. But can you, yeah, he, that was the thing. Read it in the story, I'm telling you. And read the cultural context because it makes sense. Go back to the sermon that I preached about that, okay? Seriously. But Jesus looks at them and he breathes. It's a different kind of oxygen that enters their body. It's an empowering of the spirit. It's something that changes in the atmosphere, something that changes in their soul. It's an awakening moment. Jesus Christ himself over and over again says, I'm going to destroy the temple. And that day they had a religious order of things. They had a way that they did things. And Jesus is like, look, I'm going to destroy it. And your body, your soul, your heart, you are where my spirit is going to be. You are going to become the temple. You are going to become the temple. The temple is, you know, you will be where I dwell. In, in you. That's where I dwell. And Jesus was like, look, you are alive. And you are alive in a different way. Everything changes here. Everything's different. Everything is new. Everything about your existence. Everything about your life. Everything about who you are is completely different. You are alive because of the power of a spirit. Because of the power of his spirit, I so desperately, and this isn't just like a one-time event, okay? I need you to understand that. This isn't just a one-time moment like, okay, I feel great now. Thank you, Jesus. Why? Because we get worn out. And that spirit that fills us, his spirit, his hope, his promise, his peace, his love, his compassion, his mercy, all that stuff that fills us, we're like, yes, I'm going, let's go, let's get it done. And then all of a sudden, we face something, we hit something, and we're like suddenly back behind the locked doors that we were brought out of. And we're like, okay, here I am again, right? That's that whole saying it again, and Jesus suddenly shows up, and there he is saying it again. Don't be afraid that he can show up wherever he wants to. 
Don't be afraid of that. Be hopeful about that. Be hopeful about the fact that you can't lock him out. I understand that it is your choice to accept the gift that he gives you, but you can be assured that he will be with you. He is there. Like some of us, we get to these places where like, oh, I've, I need to invite Jesus. I need to invite God to this space. No. I understand that it is a prayer that we pray like, we want, we want you here, God. But the truth is, is that, that God is already here. The Bible says that he is everywhere. And I can't put my mind in that. I can't fully understand that. I just know that he is here. He is present. He is always present in the darkest of places, in the most pleasant of places, in the most broken and devastating and hurting places, and in the most beautiful of places. He is there. And Jesus is telling us this morning that he wants to bring us peace. This Easter, he's telling us right now, I want you to be at peace. Why? Because we are living in a world where peace is not present. And we are pursuing all kinds of things. We are, we are pursuing peace. We are pursuing candidates. We are pursuing changes in government. We are pursuing changes in policies. We're, we're pursuing changes in all of these different areas. And I'm not saying that you should not fight or defend, fight for your freedoms. That's not what I'm saying, okay? It's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that when you begin to put your hope in that kind of kingdom, you will never be at peace because there will never be a peace until Jesus returns, period. It is never going to come. And so, like, your world could be wrecked. There can be havoc everywhere. How do I know this? Because I've been there. There can be havoc everywhere. And you're just like, man, I am in the middle of the storm. And you know what I feel? I feel at peace because Jesus is with me. He is with me. There is no place that he cannot be. There is no place where he can be excluded. He is is with us right now. He is with you right now. You may be locked up. You may be imprisoning yourself. You may be refusing. All right? Refusing his freedom. That's true. All right? He's a gentleman. All right? He, he, he cannot deny himself. He is perfectly loving and he's perfectly just. And a perfectly loving and just God would not demand or force us to follow. We're like, man, why, why couldn't he just taken care of it? Why couldn't he have just, you know, like taken sin away and make us do what we're supposed to do? I don't know about you guys, but I don't like being forced to do things I, 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 I don't want to do. And I know that the forcing that he would want us to do is a good thing, if you will, but his love and his mercy and his compassion, his perfect love and his perfect justice is like, no, I'm giving you freedom to love me. That is your decision. And so when he comes to us and he says, look, peace be with you. Shalom. Here, here is my peace. My peace is going to set you free. I'm going to enter the locked places in your life, the most broken places, the most devastated places, the most haunting of places, horrifying of places. I'm going to be there. And I'm going to say, peace. And you have an option. You have a choice in that moment to say, hmm, I got this, or I don't have it, and I need you to help me. And I, I know that there is like this, this like connect. Sometimes we don't have a full understanding, all right? The, you know, we're told by Paul that he will give us, when we pray and seek his face and, and we ask him for his help, he will give us a peace that surpasses or a peace that passes understanding, a peace that we can't make sense of. And I've been there before where I've experienced a peace that I can't make sense of. I just know because I've been there. You see... It is to the glory and wonder of God that all of the complexity of life, which no one really understands, is familiar territory for Jesus. Right. He's like, hey, I've been here. I've been there. I know what's what. I'm, I'm right. I'm right here. I've been in the brokenness. I've been in the, I've been in the pain. I've been in the struggles. I've been in all of those things. I know exactly what you're going through, Seth. I know exactly what you're facing. They rejected me too. They hated me. They, they denied me. They, they, they refused to accept what I'm saying, Seth. The, I understand what you're going through. Jesus understands everything. He understands the complexities of life. He understands everything that's broken, everything that's, that's messed up. He's right there with you. 
And he's like, hey, not once, but he says it twice. And I know that it captures twice, but I assure you that he's willing to say it more than that. Why do I know this? Because I'm hard-headed, all right? And I've had to hear it over and over again in my own life. Peace be with you, Seth. My peace I give to you. My peace I give to you. It is, it is the day of his resurrection. They're hearing things, but what they do know and what they're terrified of is that they're going to die in the same way. Now, if you follow the Gospels, and if you follow the story, you will find out that they do end up dying for their faith in Jesus. That does indeed happen. It does. It does. They, 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 they face death fearlessly because they trusted Jesus and they had no fear in that. They do. But in this moment, the fear was different. They, they, they died fearlessly. In this moment, they would have died full of fear, terrified. Terrified of what was coming, terrified of, of, of everything that could have happened. I usually ask you questions at the end of our, our sermons, but I just want to make a statement to you, and this is what I want to ask you to do. When you feel fear, when you feel it, look to the Savior and just breathe. When you feel fear, look to the Savior and just breathe breathe it's real some of us in this room like we're really this is like nailing it we're like man i'm scared things aren't going so well i didn't think it was going to be like this i can't tell you the amount of times that i hear myself saying what i never thought i would say i never thought i'd be in a world like this i never thought that there would be this kind of chaos i never thought that there'd be this kind of brokenness this kind of pain you guys need to know this morning that Jesus, he took it all. He was broken for us. He was physically devastated. He was beaten and nailed to a criminal's cross. We put it around our necks. We even tattoo it on our bodies. I have one. But the, the cross wasn't an elegant, beautiful thing. It was an instrument of torture. The Romans were good at it too, man. They made it their business to make people suffer. There are things that I could tell you. There are things that I have discovered educationally about what they did. It was brutal. It wasn't like, oh, this is the cross that Jesus died on, so we'll never use it again. I guarantee, I can't guarantee, but I bet you, right after he died on it and they buried him, they crucified some other criminal on the same cross he was crucified on. Because that's what they did. And Jesus, this was the plan the whole time. This was the plan the whole time. And I don't understand it all. I just know that I'm messed up and I'm broken and I couldn't fix it on my own. So I had a Savior who came perfect and said, hey, look, the God of the universe, the judge of all is looking at me saying, you're condemned because you sin, because you are evil inside. You are an evil person. And Jesus is like, hey, but I got a plan here. And he steps in our place and <laughs> we're, we're <laughs> we are deserving of wrath. This is not comfortable, guys. This is not comfortable. We are deserving of wrath. And Jesus walks right in front and says, hey, look, I know this man I know this woman, and I know they're messed up. They are messed up beyond messed up of all messed up. But I got this. I'm, I'm going to do it for them. And some of us in this room, man, we're messed up. We are, we are troubled. We are broken. But I tell you right now, I've met people before in my life that are, that are in prison, that are broken, that are terrified. Murderers who have said, I'm too far gone. And then suddenly Jesus shows up and is like, hey, I'm here. I'm here to offer peace. I'm here to offer love. I'm here. You need to accept it. It's got to be something that you willingly embrace. But just so you know, it's yours. Peace with God. Peace, yes, even as hard as it is, peace with man. Peace with women, peace with the people around you, peace with the creator of the universe, peace with yourself. 
Man, some of us, we look inside and we're like, Ugh, I can never feel peaceful about those decisions that I made. I can never be okay with this. Some of us have made some really, really terrible choices. And it's not that, it, like, if someone were to, you know, see it, they would be like, oh, you're evil. No, some of us, man, it just hits us different. And we're like, I can't live with that anymore. And Jesus is saying to us right now, you don't have to. You don't have to. Because... I'm here to set you free. I'm here to release you of that. We get to celebrate today. Today is resurrection day. Today is the day that Jesus looked death in the face and said, no. My beloved, the people have responded, the people have come to me, no. He's not going to just shove it back. No, he, he destroys it. He ends its reign. I have met people before that are right on death's door. And they've been scared and prayed with them and watched as immense peace just entered them and changed everything. I'll never forget the day I walked into a nursing home. Family called me desperate. I walked into the nursing home and I walked into the, where this woman was and she was screaming. She was shouting. She was terrified. Terrified. She was dying. She was terrified. And I leaned over and I said, what is wrong? Are you okay? I didn't say it like that, but I said, what is wrong? Are you okay? And she said, I'm scared. And then she began to recollect the things that she had done in this life. And I just said, Jesus wants to forgive you today. And she grabbed me by the shirt and she said, help. And I prayed for peace for her. You can't make this stuff up, okay? I prayed for peace with her. And I turned and walked two steps and she was gone. Because suddenly she wasn't afraid. She didn't have to fight anymore. She was at peace. We need that. I want some of that. I want some of that. You with me? Amen. Amen. So, again, when you feel fear, look to the Savior and just breathe. Because he wants to set you free and breathe life into you. He wants to empower you with this spirit. He wants to take you places and do things you never thought possible. Jesus, I pray today for freedom. I pray today for hope. I pray right now, Lord, that as we consider the 11 disciples that were locked in that room, terrified of their situation, terrified of what's going on, terrified, terrified because their teacher, the one that they loved, the one that they followed, the one that they knew in their own hearts would be reigning king, died in a way that they didn't expect. It didn't go as planned, and they were scared. And you were suddenly there, transported, just miraculously standing with them. And just delicately and lovingly gave them peace and life. So when we feel fear, Lord, help us to look to you and take a deep breath. Jesus, we celebrate life today. We celebrate resurrection today. And I pray, God, that if there's anybody in this room, anybody who's watching online that has yet to respond to the promise, the gift, the very thing that you will do that will set them free, I pray that this would be their moment, Jesus. Lord, that we're not going to do this every, you know, eye closed, every head bowed and raise your hand. Jesus, if there's somebody in this room who needs prayer right now because they have yet to respond, I pray, God, that is when I say amen, that they meet me down here. And for those who are watching online, I pray, God, that they would feel strong conviction and, God, that they would 
put it in the comments or they would send a message to the church or me or, or find a way to get a hold of someone who can pray with them and that everything would change. Jesus, we need your peace right now. It's in your beautiful and holy name we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you guys need prayer, come find me. I know some of you guys didn't get your pictures. I can meet you after that if you want to stick around for a little bit. You guys are awesome. Be blessed. Be encouraged. Take a deep breath today and experience life. Love you, Pastor. Love you too. <laughs>